Investments are not FDIC insured, nor are they deposits of or guaranteed by a bank or any other entity, so they may lose value. American funds are not available outside the U.S. The following is not intended as an offer to purchase or distribute American funds outside the U.S. I'm Matt Miller, and this is Capital Ideas, your connection to the minds and insights helping to shape the world of investments. Today, we have another episode from our Author Encounter series, where we hear from investment-relevant writers about their latest work. Author Chris Miller, no relation to yours truly, recently paid a virtual visit to Capital Group to discuss his new book, Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. It's a fascinating read that delves deep into the history of the computer chip, while also providing a sober view into the geopolitical struggle to control the strategically vital semiconductor industry. Over the next few minutes, we'll play excerpts from Chris Miller's commentary, sprinkled with a few interstitial words from your humble host. First up, we start with a brief overview of the book, which just landed at bookstores and online venues this Tuesday, October 4th. And of course, a warm welcome for Chris. Well, thank you very much. Matt, for the invitation to join this discussion. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share the sneak peeks into uh, my book. Um, it's been a fun couple of months for me to prepare for publication because I've gotten lucky by the fact that semiconductors are more and more in the news as time passes, whether it's semiconductor shortages affecting supply chains, whether it's uh, the US and China jockeying for control over the future of the chip industry, or whether it's uh, questions of uh, missile supply and uh, armaments production, which of course is as dependent on semiconductors as any other type of advanced technology today. And what I'd like to suggest is that although we associate semiconductors today with consumer electronics, like smartphones or PCs, or with data centers that make up, for example, uh, the cloud that we take for granted uh, in terms of all our data processing, the chip industry is in some ways returning to its origins and that unlike the past several decades when semiconductor supply chains were dominated by questions of economic efficiency and uh, and controlled to a large extent by consumer electronics firms, now politicians, defense officials, and national security experts are reasserting uh, a substantial degree of influence over the way semiconductor supply chains are structured. And that's true in the United States. We've seen uh, pretty substantial action from Congress and passing the CHIPS Act in recent uh, weeks, as well as from uh, parts of the national security bureaucracy, which have been imposing new controls over the ability of U.S. firms to export chip technology to China. But we've also seen other countries undertaking a similar type of politicization or securitization of their own semiconductor industries. And China, I think, is a great example of this, where Xi Jinping since 2014 has prioritized indigenous technological development of semiconductors is a key policy goal of the Chinese Communist Party. With that setup, Chris explains why today's big conflicts over tiny chips are nothing new, but more like going back to the future. This is a return to historical norms in many ways because the semiconductor emerged not out of consumer electronics at first, but out of a missile race. The first semiconductors were produced intending uh, to be used to guide rockets and missiles uh, around the United States, around the world, and eventually outside of the world as well. The first major order of semiconductors after they were invented in the late 1950s was for the guidance computer in the Apollo spacecraft. The second major order of semiconductors uh, one year later was for the guidance computer in the uh, Minuteman II intercontinental ballistic missile. And since the earliest days of the chip industry, the Pentagon uh, has had an enormous interest in semiconductor technology. When we look at the view from the Pentagon today or the view from other parts of uh, national security uh, organizations in the United States, these organizations are interested in semiconductors because chips are crucial to today's military systems. So when you think about next generation military technologies, autonomous drones, for example, or advanced electronic warfare systems. These will be even more dependent on processing power, on memory, and on sensors than the current generation of technology. And anything that depends on processing power depends on computer chips, which is why uh, the Defense Department is more focused than ever on its ability to 
uh, access the most advanced computer chips and understand uh, ways that they can prevent adversaries from accessing uh, their own versions of these chips. One important step the U.S. has taken to achieve this goal of chip supremacy is to pass the CHIPS Act. It's a multi-billion dollar spending bill approved by Congress in July that seeks to boost the domestic semiconductor industry. Chris provides more detail on that legislation and what it means for U.S. production. Both countries, the United States and China, are fixated on reinforcing their domestic chip industries. And the U.S., this has uh, been most visible in the CHIPS Act, which is going to spend $39 billion over the next couple of years on incentives to fabricate more chips at home. Because one of the big trends in recent decades has to continue designing chips in the U.S., but actually have their manufacture take place in places like Taiwan and South Korea. The United States, although it's had its position in the fabrication of semiconductors eroded uh, in recent years, still has a powerful position in the semiconductor supply chain. And it's worth, I think, taking one minute to run through what it actually takes to make a chip to understand why the U.S. government has so many choke points that it can exercise control over. If you want to make a chip, you need, first off, ultra-specialized software to design chips. There are three firms that produce this software, all of which are based in the United States. Then you need to access silicon wafers and a set of other chemicals that are among the most pure chemicals uh, that have ever been produced. And uh, they that require quality levels of 99.999% uh, to have uh, chip production be as, as accurate and as precise as it needs to be. And there's a small number of firms focused largely in Japan that produce uh, these materials and chemicals. Then you use these chemicals with a set of uh, machine tools that are among the most complicated machine tools ever made in history. There's machine tools for lithography, for depositing uh, these chemicals, for etching them at nanoscopic scale. And uh, these machine tools must be so precise that they can etch shapes that are smaller than a coronavirus at a scale of uh, billions per chip. Uh, the, the scale is, is truly mind boggling when you begin to think about it. Um, and just to give you one example of the number of uh, tiny transistors that we're talking about. If you just take one version of an iPhone, take the iPhone 14, for example, and choose one of the chips in that iPhone, TSMC, the Taiwanese company that has uh, produced these chips for Apple, produced over one quintillion transistors. That's 10 to the 18th uh, number of transistors simply for this one type of chip and one type of consumer product. So the precision necessary to do this at scale uh, is, is really extraordinary. After you've begun uh, the process of, um, of actually making chips, you then need to package these chips uh, into consumer goods. And this is uh, part of the process that increasingly happens uh, outside of the United States and in uh, parts of East and Southeast Asia, especially Taiwan and China. And then finally, you, um, after chips are assembled, you plug them into a consumer good and they're delivered uh, to a customer. When you aggregate up this supply chain, it's still the case that the United States produces about 40% of the economic value in the semiconductor supply chain, with South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan playing second, third, and fourth positions. Those positions could be changing, however. As Chris notes, China has big aspirations in the semiconductor industry. China is actually sixth behind uh, even Europe in terms of its role in the semiconductor supply chain today. But the scale of investment that China's government is pouring into semiconductors is likely to change this going forward. And if you project forward to the end of the decade, uh, around 2030, around half of chip production, the fabrication of chips themselves, is expected to take place either in Taiwan or in China, with the most advanced chip making in Taiwan less advanced chip making in China. But of course, with the increasing geopolitical tension between uh, China, Taiwan, and the United States, this uh, amounts to a really substantial risk for uh, the global economy. And indeed, as US-China tension in general has ratcheted up, semiconductors have uh, been a major point of contestation uh, in the United States. Uh, Congress has pushed both under the Trump administration and the Biden administration for much stricter controls and the transfer of technology to China. Chinese officials, meanwhile, have even suggested they might seize Taiwan for the purpose of grabbing control of Taiwan's chip-making capabilities today. And 
Uh, Taiwan is a crucially important node in this process because although Taiwanese firms like the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company are heavily reliant on imported chemicals and equipment from the United States, Japan, and other countries, the actual fabrication of chips in Taiwan is the most advanced of any country in the world. There are chips produced in Taiwan that no one else knows how to produce. Best example of this probably is the chip in your iPhone, which no other company in the world can make. They can only be manufactured on the island of Taiwan. And this has uh, created an enormous vulnerability um, for not only companies like Apple, which are reliant on fabrication in Taiwan, but for the entire global economy. Nowadays, Taiwan produces around a third of the incremental computing power that we produce each year. If you add up all the transistors that are fabricated in chip making plants around the world, Taiwan fabricates one third of them, which means that if Taiwanese chip making facilities were to go dark next year, either they were disrupted by a blockade or knocked offline by a war, the world would face an enormous deficit of computing power. And the effects would really be economically disastrous. It would be difficult to produce a single smartphone in the year after a collapse of Taiwanese chip making capacity. PC production would plummet, data center build out would grind to a halt. It would be almost impossible to construct a new cell phone tower for at least a year as we tried to redirect capacity elsewhere. It would make the economic shocks of COVID, I think, look relatively minor uh, by comparison because almost every good with an on-off switch today requires a semiconductor and the vast majority of advanced semiconductors today are produced in Taiwan. That's quite an eye-opening assessment. So what's being done about it? Chris continues. Because of Taiwan's uh, enormous importance in the chip industry and to the electronics industry more generally, there are efforts underway to try to diversify the fabrication base. And part of the goal of the CHIPS Act in the United States is to incentivize Taiwanese companies like TSMC, the biggest of the Taiwanese chip manufacturers, to open up facilities in the U.S. And indeed, TSMC has uh, already begun work on a new facility in Arizona, as well as um, planned facilities in Japan and Singapore. So it's beginning slowly to uh, shift its base of fabrication. But it's still the case that around 80 or 85 percent of, of dollars invested by TSMC are invested on the island of Taiwan, which means that Taiwan's crucial importance uh, in the fabrication of semiconductors is not going to go away anytime soon, even if the CHIPS Act is uh, as effective as it realistically be expected to be. One has to wonder, what does all of this mean for U.S.-China relations in the years ahead? Will the struggle over chip supremacy continue to escalate, or will the economic interdependence of these two powerful nations eventually lead to a more pragmatic solution? Chris offers his view. So zooming out, the U.S.-China geopolitical relationship is intensifying just as America's and the world's reliance on Taiwan for manufacturing ships is growing simultaneously. And Taiwan, of course, is an influential player because of its shipmaking capabilities, but it's heavily reliant on importing tools, machinery, and software from countries like the U.S. and Japan. And so we find ourselves in a very complicated interdependence with Taiwan and also with China, because, of course, many of the chips that TSMC produces are ultimately assembled into smartphones or computers or servers on mainland China. And all of the efforts, both by Chinese leaders and by U.S. leaders to disentangle these supply chains and thereby reduce security risk have only had a limited effect thus far. It's still the case that TSMC's largest customer is Apple, and it's still the case that most of Apple's smartphones are assembled in China, although Apple is uh, slowly beginning to diversify its assembly base to places like Vietnam and India. So when you listen to politicians in the U.S. and China elsewhere talk about uh, supply chain security, I think it's worth keeping in mind the, uh, the situation that they find themselves in, which is that uh, they're at the whim of a tiny number of companies that control the industry. Uh, these companies' uh, capital investment plans are shaped to some extent um, by politics, both by subsidy programs and by the demands of uh, defense interests, but also uh, profoundly shaped by market forces as well, demands for consumer goods, for example, or the, um, the interests of their uh, of their customers. And so the semiconductor industry is 
being pulled apart in two different directions. On the one hand, a demand for increasing efficiency um, from the users of chips. On the other hand, more and more pressure from defense officials to separate supply chains, to reduce entanglement with China, and, uh, and ultimately to cut China off from the most advanced chip technology. But so long as TSMC remains the world's most important chip maker, so long as TSMC has technological capabilities that exceed America's most advanced production, any sort of disentanglement with China in absolute terms remains a very distant dream because uh, for better or for worse, the world's advanced chip making capabilities are today centered on a small island uh, just offshore of China, which uh, the PRC still considers a renegade province. And so the risk, I think, of U.S.-China tension increasing will therefore hang over the semiconductor industry for some time, uh, regardless of the CHIPS Act and regardless of all the other efforts to guarantee the security of our semiconductor supply. Okay, there you have it. We said it would be a sobering viewpoint, and indeed it is. I'd like to thank author Chris Miller for joining us and sharing his insightful commentary. The book is Chip War, the Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. I've read it. It's terrific. And I encourage anyone who's interested in the semiconductor industry to check it out. For Capital Ideas, this is Matt Miller, reminding you that the most valuable asset is a long-term perspective. Investors should carefully consider investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. This and other important information is contained in the fund prospectuses and summary prospectuses, which can be obtained from a financial professional and should be read carefully before investing. American Funds Distributors, Inc. Member, FINRA. Investing outside the United States involves risks, such as currency fluctuations, periods of illiquidity, and price volatility, as more fully described in the prospectus. These risks may be heightened in connection with investments in developing countries. Small company stocks entail additional risks, and they can fluctuate in price more than larger company stocks. The return of principal for bond funds and for funds with significant underlying bond holdings is not guaranteed. Fund shares are subject to the same interest rate, inflation, and credit risks associated with the underlying bond holdings. Lower-rated bonds are subject to greater fluctuations in value and risk of loss of income and principal than higher-rated bonds. Statements attributed to an individual represent the opinions of that individual as of the date published and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Capital Group or its affiliates. This information is intended to highlight issues and should not be considered advice, an endorsement, or a recommendation. Any reference to a company, product, or service does not constitute endorsement or recommendation for purchase and should not be considered investment advice. This content, developed by Capital Group, home of American funds, should not be used as a primary basis for investment decisions and is not intended to serve as impartial investment or fiduciary advice. American funds are intended only for persons eligible to purchase U.S. registered mutual funds. Not all Capital Group model portfolios are available outside the U.S. The Capital Ideas websites are not intended for use by Canadian audiences. In Canada, please visit capitalgroup.com slash CA for Capital Group Insights. For listeners in Canada, commissions, trailing commissions, management fees, and expenses all may be associated with mutual fund investments. Please read the prospectus before investing. Mutual funds are not guaranteed. Their values change frequently and past performance may not be repeated. Capital Group funds are available in Canada through registered dealers. For your individual situation, please consult your financial and tax advisors. Capital International Asset Management Canada, Inc. is a wholly owned subsidiary of Capital Group. Please visit capitalgroup.com slash CA for more information. American funds are not available in Canada. For listeners in Asia, Australia, the information in this communication is of a general nature. This communication has been prepared by Capital International Inc., a member of Capital Group, a company incorporated in California, United States of America. The liability of members is limited. In Australia, this communication is issued by Capital Group Investment Management Limited. ACN 164-174-501 AFSL number 443-118. A member of Capital Group, located at level 18, 56 Pitt Street, Sydney, NSW 2000, Australia. All Capital Group trademarks mentioned are owned by the Capital Group Companies, Inc., an affiliated company or fund. All other company and product names mentioned are the property of their respective company. For listeners in European countries, excluding Switzerland and UK, this communication is issued by Capital International Management Company, SAR, authorized and regulated by the Commission de Surveillance du Secteur Financier, a subsidiary of the Capital Group Companies, Inc., Capital Group. For listeners in Switzerland, this communication is issued by Capital International SAR, authorized and regulated by the Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority, FINMA, a subsidiary of the Capital Group Companies, Inc., Capital Group. For listeners in UK, this communication is issued by Capital International Limited, authorized and regulated by the UK Financial Conduct Authority, a subsidiary of the Capital Group Companies, Inc., Capital Group. 